Good morning, everyone. Go ahead and invite you to take out your Bibles with me and turn to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll get to there here in just a couple minutes. It's a bit of a rare occasion for me to be here on a Sunday morning, and particularly here on a Sunday morning and preaching, but I'm thankful to have this opportunity and grateful that Mike let me preach this morning in no small part because I have my in-laws in town, um, so I hope I can be on my A game this morning. But with that being said, if we stick to the truth of Scripture and we let God speak to us, then that's the best A game that we will ever have. And I hope to be able to do that this morning. When I say the word Armageddon, what do you think of? Might be a loaded term for some of you in your minds. Uh, Maybe for some of you, when you think of Armageddon, you think of the 1998 movie starring Bruce Willis in which there's this giant asteroid hurtling towards Earth. And in a matter of weeks, they have to send a team up there, led by Bruce Willis, a bunch of drillers, to go to that asteroid and drill a hole into it and like detonate a nuclear bomb to save the world. And that's kind of a crazy movie, some wild stuff going on. Let me tell you, Armageddon can get a whole lot crazier than that when you take it different places. Sometimes Armageddon is applied in the religious realm, in the Christian realm, as talking about a giant war that's going to take place at the end of time. And all of a sudden, wrapped up in the idea of Armageddon, you have uh, doctrinal ideas of what the end times are going to look like. Is there going to be a big war? Is there going to be Armageddon? The thing about Armageddon and the doctrine of it with the end times is it's not just Armageddon that's talked about. Now, usually wrapped up in the idea of Armageddon, you have ideas like the rapture and the Antichrist and tribulations and a thousand year reign on the earth, all kind of falling under the broad umbrella of what we will call millennialism, doctrines of the end times. I imagine when you woke up this morning and came to church, this is not the lesson that you thought you were going to hear. And that makes sense. It's not something we talk about a whole lot. I I don't hear too many lessons preached on the idea of millennialism, uh, but it's a very real thing. It's a very real doctrine, things that people believe in in relation to how the world is going to end and what the end times are going to look like. And so the reason that I want to preach this lesson is kind of threefold. One, the simple reason is what we've been doing, finishing out this year with our Bible reading program. If you've been here, you've been hearing some lessons on Revelation. We've been going through that book and finishing out this year, and this doctrine is something that lines up a lot with how people view Revelation, how they read it, and how there are a lot of misconceptions on how that book is supposed to be read and wrestling with the apocalyptic literature of it, so that's one reason. Another reason that this this doctrine is very real, and there's a lot of people who do believe in it. I don't know exactly the numbers here in the Silicon Valley of the people who believe in this. It probably is more popular in certain parts of the world than others, but this is a doctrine that is widely taught and believed in to a variety of degrees in a variety of ways. And then thirdly, I want to preach this because there are certain things going on in the world right now that people are looking at and thinking, does this line up with what this doctrine preaches? Well, you have society in general kind of going downhill, and then you have things like the war in Israel over there in the Middle East. Is God preparing us for World War III? Are the end times like right now in which we're leading up to this tribulation and a thousand year reign and all of that? Because a lot of people are trying to grapple with that and thinking that's exactly what's happening right now. So when you have those different factors, it leads me to want to go back to the scriptures and see what the scriptures say about all of this. And this is a a big topic with a lot to chew on, and I hope to do my best to uh, lay this out in a brief but effective way. Um, If this all goes well, this is actually going to be a two-part lesson. First one obviously coming this morning, and then if you're here next week on Sunday night, I plan to do a follow-up because there's a lot to say about this and, and little time to say it. But with that being said, before we get into the idea of millennialism, which may be familiar to some of you, maybe not to others, I want to set the foundation for why I'm going at this lesson and why we need lessons like this in general. So I ask you to turn to 2 Peter with me. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, I want you to read with me verses 16 through 21. 
For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What is this passage saying, if you were to boil it down? Well, it talks about holy men coming in different time periods, maybe men like prophets, men like the apostles, Peter, even men like Jesus. And where were they getting their words and their messages? Well, it makes very clear here and in many other places that they're just not making things up. No, they're getting it from a divine source. They're being moved by the Holy Spirit, and it's not up to them to say whatever they want about any sort of subject. No, their truth is ultimately derived from God above, a simple chain of authority that we have. And the words of God should never be altered. Because the thing is, if we look at Scripture and we try to twist it, if we look at the apostles and the prophets and say, yeah, they were saying one thing, but they didn't really know what they were talking about, and different things have happened and things that have popped up that they never saw coming, and all of a sudden things are changing, no, they're not. They're not. No, these words were meant for us for all time. And when we try to twist them, we try to twist the prophecies and the different scriptures, we are ultimately saying, God, your truth is not good enough. God, you're kind of a liar. And there's going to be a day that comes in which people are going to do this. That's what he kind of introduces in the next chapter. Just read the first two verses with me. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. So he's warning the people, in your day and age, there are going to be people who come and try to lead you off the path with these destructive heresies. Guess what? That's still happening today in many different ways. And so the responsibility falls on us to preach the truth. If people like this pop up, because the Bible is very clear that it will happen. Just like we read in the scripture reading a moment ago, 2 Timothy chapter 4, people will turn aside to myths and fables, and they're not going to look at the truth of the scripture in the way that God would have it to be read. So once again, what's the responsibility for us? Uh, preach the truth. Be a steady rock for the word. No matter what anyone else is teaching, what everyone else is doing, we have to get this right, because if we don't get this right, then we've missed the mark on everything. That's how we have to look at the scriptures. And these are very simple points, lessons that you've heard from the pulpit here numerous times. But once again, this is just the foundation that we're trying to go at this. So with that being said, the truth of scripture can be found in relation to this doctrine also. And people are twisting it. So when it comes to the idea of millennialism, which I want to dive into now, uh, there are many different avenues and paths that you could take talking about it. Like I said, it's a broad umbrella dealing with different doctrines of the end times. And originally, when I was preparing this lesson, I was going to briefly do a general overview of a few of the different types, but I realized that would take a little bit too long. So I'm going to be honing in on one in particular, which is uh, the most prevalent today anyways, and that is pre-millennialism, which maybe that's something that you've heard of before. Maybe not. If you haven't, hopefully we can explain it well for you. Now, the underlying factor throughout all of these different doctrines is that idea of millennialism, which if you're making a simple definition of it, would be Christ establishing a literal 1,000-year kingdom here on the earth. That's where your millennial word comes from, a 1,000 years. And uh, we'll say just here in a moment where we get that from looking in the book of Revelation. But from there, this doctrine is taken and more details are added to it and it's expounded in a variety of ways. And premillennialism is one of those areas that has been bred out of this whole millennial doctrine. Uh, premillennialism 
Um, it also has a couple of different forms. We're going to be looking at the modern day version of premillennialism because it's more likely the whole thing that you will counter today with different people who believe in this. Now, here I have just a brief description. On the next slide, we're going to have a chart that will provide more of a visual representation of what I'm talking about. So premillennialism, which we would call modern or dispensational premillennialism, deals with an overall timeline of a rapture of the church, tribulation, a return with the church, a millennium, and a judgment day. Now, let's blow this up a little bit more. And this is a, a chart for it. And if it looks like a lot, don't get overwhelmed. We're going to try to go, uh, go through it and talk through it. Uh, some of this stuff you don't necessarily need to know or get bogged down in the details right now with like these different rapture views and all of that. But let's kind of go through this chart in a general timeline and see what it's trying to teach us. First off, in the Old Testament, you have God's people. You have Israel and you have their journey across time, how you know God calls Abraham and makes them a special people and leads them out of Egypt and brings them into the promised land. And, and you have the Old Testament finishing and how all of these different arrows we read seem to be pointing towards something else that's coming, seem to be pointing toward Jesus Christ. And then you get to the time period of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ comes, but what happens to Jesus Christ? Well, he dies. He's crucified by what people? The Jewish people, they're the ones that shouted, crucify him, crucify him, for a variety of different reasons that we read about throughout the scriptures. That is not exactly what was supposed to happen. At least that's what the premillennial doctrine will state. Whenever Jesus Christ came, Israel rejected him. And in so doing, rejected God's plan, which was a big oopsie. It was not supposed to happen that way. Jesus didn't really see this coming. God didn't really see this coming. And all of a sudden, what has to happen? Well, God has to implement what we will call a plan B. And plan B is you and me. We're plan B right now. This church, the whole age that we're living in right now, the church age, we are living in God's plan B that was never supposed to happen in the first place because the Jews were supposed to accept Jesus, and he was supposed to reign here on the earth as a physical king and do all of those things that a physical king does. But that's not what happened. And so now we are living in the church age, which some people will call the parenthetical age. Basically, you take a big parenthesis and put it around the timeline that we're living in right now, in which the prophetic clock has stopped. The whole world is holding its breath, waiting for Jesus to come back and fulfill what was supposed to happen way back then, if the Jews had actually accepted him and things had gone according to the plan. So that's the time period we're living in right now, a mistake. And ultimately, this time period is going to lead toward another major event, what we will call the rapture. And so for uh, clarification's sake, just look at that arrow number one of when this is going to happen, the rapture. Uh, the rapture basically states that there's going to be Christians who are living here on the earth that all of a sudden are going to go poof. They're going to disappear in a random day, random life. You're going to have you know, people in the house, people out in the fields, pilots up in the air that are just going to disappear. And obviously that has some uh, pretty wild implications with planes falling out of the sky and everything like that. But that's what's going to happen. All these Christians who are truly following God are going to get raptured up into the air to go hang out with Jesus in the sky for a period of time. Now, with this rapture, there's going to usher in this specific time period, a seven-year time period in which there are people who are left behind here on the earth, all the people who didn't get raptured. Now, for those people who are left behind, during this time period, some of them are going to realize, hey, my, uh, my mom's gone, my husband is gone, my kids are gone, what happened to them? Well, I probably need to do something with my life. If being a Christian means you get to go be up there, like I probably need to turn to God. And some people are going to do that. They're going to realize, you know, I probably need to start living a Christian life. And so during this time, there's going to be some people who, even though they weren't Christians before, are going to convert to Christ while here on the earth. But it's not necessarily going to go very well for them. 
Because during this time period, if they're converting to Christ, they're going to suffer for it. There's going to be a lot of tribulation. There's going to be people who rise up in society, who have a lot of power, that are going to persecute Christians quite heavily. You're going to have these leaders and, and political leaders of nations that are going to grow in power and persecute Christians until halfway through, halfway through this seven-year time period. So three and a half years in, one of these big leaders is going to be revealed as a pretty important character, the Antichrist. So three and a half years in, the Antichrist is going to be revealed, and all of a sudden things are going to get a whole lot worse for Christians. There's going to be the great tribulational period right now for the second three and a half years, in which persecution ramps up and ramps up, and it seems that all hope is lost until, boom, guess who comes back? The church, Jesus Christ, return from up there in the sky to come down here on the earth, and Armageddon. It's time for war. That's the timeline of when the war is supposed to happen. Whenever things are ramping up, the seven-year period ends, and Jesus Christ and the church come back. And this is kind of one of the modern-day illustrations that helps me to think about it. If you've ever seen the Avengers movies before, the last one, Avengers Endgame, if you can remember the end of it, where there's just like Captain America standing against all the forces of evil, but then you have all these portals opening behind him and all the good guys come streaming out. Uh, that's pretty much what this is saying, that all these good forces are going to appear and gather together over in Israel in the area of Megiddo, which is where you get the word Armageddon, um, in the valley of Megiddo, which is actually more of a plain or a mountain anyway, but people will say it's a valley. They're going to gather together and there's going to be this huge war, probably some nuclear stuff going on. But in the end, who wins? Well, of course, the good guys win. Jesus wins. That's the whole theme of Revelation anyways, isn't it? Jesus Christ wins all the time. And he wins in this situation also. And so the Armageddon battle is won by Jesus and his forces. And from there, Jesus can now go into Jerusalem. He can literally resurrect the throne of David, which is buried somewhere underneath the temple complex, somewhere under the Dome of the Rock there in modern-day Israel. He's going to resurrect it. He's going to sit on that throne, and he is going to reign on the earth now for a thousand years. Good times of peace. Another detail which is pretty significant with this whole doctrine is that Israel is going to be restored. So who's going to get to be a part of this thousand-year reign? Well, all the Jews are, because they were God's special people to begin with, and they've always been God's special people. And so they're going to get to join Christ as Christians now in this thousand-year reign here on the earth. Now, as you continue forward in this timeline, the thousand-year period ends. When this period ends, Satan is loose for a little bit of time. And when Satan is loose, some of the people who were reigning with Christ in this thousand-year period are all of a sudden going to turn to Satan's side randomly for some reason. They're going to turn to his side, and there's going to be another little spat, which is not much of a spat at all because Satan and his followers are, are quickly defeated and taken care of and cast in the lake of fire and brimstone. And at that point, now the final judgment can happen, and, and the end of time is truly ushered in. That's a lot, right? That's a, that's a lot to chew on, especially if you haven't really gone through this before or thought about it. But this is what people believe in. And there's a lot of people who believe in this, at least certain aspects of it. The people you run into may not be able to just go through and explain all of this verbatim, but certain elements will definitely stick out in their minds. Like, yeah, Jesus Christ reigning for a thousand years on earth. Or, yeah, I, I believe in the rapture and antichrist and you know, tribulation, stuff like that. But there are also some pretty big-name proponents who are teaching this in our world right now. I mean, John MacArthur down there in L.A., he's a big proponent of this. We've had other men along the way, uh, Dwight Pentecost, Charles Ryrie, and all of this kind of traces its roots back to this guy John Nelson Darby in the 1800s especially, and then popularized in the Schofield Reference Bible. But it's just taken off since then. And now you, you move up more towards our day and age, and you have books like this that are being written, which maybe you've heard before or heard of the movies associated with them. Uh, the Left Behind series, which 
There's 12 books here. There's actually 16 in total in this set, uh, quite a lot of material, written by this guy, Tim LaHaye, who is a, a huge proponent of this. And, and what these books teach is basically a fictional but not so fictional view of what's going to happen in the future whenever this rapture happens and then there are people who are left behind. And that's their story of what this is going to look like in real world terms whenever the time period comes. Listen, this set has sold tens of millions of copies. There are a lot of people who read this and who believe in this. Or you have Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. That's a big one, too. I mean, you have these popular books and popular people who are promoting this. And it's not something we talk about too much. And maybe it's something that we should every once in a while think about and be able to give a defense and answers for if we come across people who believe this sort of doctrine. Now, why exactly is this doctrine here? Why, why is it here? Well, I think really when you boil it down, the reason this doctrine is here is because people will take literal interpretations of the Bible where there should not be literal interpretations of the Bible, such as Revelation. You have examples like Revelation chapter 20, which is where you get that thousand year number that several different times. You have thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. And so they'll look at that and say, boom, literal. The chapters before it in which you kind of get these uh, visions of war and Armageddon, boom, literal. Other passages in Revelation, literal. Prophets in the Old Testament, Zechariah, Daniel, oh, boom, literal. Other passages in the New Testament, literal. Listen, that's not how God was intending them to be read. You don't read poetry the same way that you read nonfiction. You don't read prophecy or apocalyptic literature the same way that you read historical narrative. That's twisting the scriptures in the way that God intended them to be read. I mean, even in the very start of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 makes it very clear how you're supposed to be reading this book, how it's signed by angels, which means to make known by signs and by symbols. That's how the people back then were reading it. That's how people today should be reading it also. And the word revelation itself means apocalypsis, apocalyptic literature. That's the angle that you're supposed to come at it from. And a lot of people just don't, or they'll at least just kind of pick and choose what they deem to be literal and what they deem not to be literal. Now, when you read Revelation in this way, and you read other passages in this literal way, you come up with doctrines like this, like a premillennial doctrine, which automatically poses several problems to how most likely you and I would read the Bible and how I believe it is supposed to be read. Now, I'm going to be going through one of these problems for the rest of the time, and then next week I plan on diving more into the second one. Because there are many different things you could say about each of them, but two problems here on the screen. We'll be focusing on the first one for the rest of the time. If premillennialism is true, if this doctrine is true, then God Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets were dead wrong in the things that they said throughout the scriptures, which also means we are not a part of the kingdom right now. Because remember, what is millennialism about? It's about the thousand-year physical, literal kingdom here on the earth in which Jesus is the physical king. If you don't get anything else, remember that key detail, the millennial reign here on the earth. Well, that's not exactly what scripture would lead you to believe. It's not exactly the way that it lays it out, which is a problem because now we're living in this mistake period in which we're not really a part of the kingdom. And so we're going to be looking at that one. Secondly, the Jews are still God's special people. That's another big one, which I'll focus more on next time. So for the rest of our time, we're going to be looking at this number one, problem number one, the prophetic kingdom. What was it supposed to look like? When was it supposed to come? What does it mean for us today? and hopefully answer a couple of these questions and show you a few passages which can help us explain. And these passages that I'm going to bring up hopefully will kind of serve as evidence and, I guess, ammunition for you to, to put uh, in yourself so that you can give an answer if you ever meet these people. So I'm going to have uh, three different slides, a couple of questions, and then kind of a, a conclusion point. First off, when we talk about this prophetic kingdom, which you read kingdom language throughout the Bible, what exactly was this kingdom supposed to look like? Was it going to look like the way that premillennialists lay it out, or is it supposed to look like something else? 
So I'll have some verses up here on the slide for you to look like. A couple of them I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles with me. But first off, John chapter 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So this is Jesus talking to Pilate, talking in response to, hey, are you a king, Jesus? This is what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. That seems pretty straightforward to me. It's not of this world. Because guess what? If my kingdom were of this world, Peter wouldn't just be chopping off ears. He would be chopping off heads. And I would allow him to do that because that's what physical kings and kingdoms do. But clearly, that's not where his focus was. It wasn't on a physical kingdom here on this world. Another one, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, these verses directly fly in the opposition of premillennialism, which, as I told you, is preparing for some big literal war here on the earth. Well, Jesus just got done saying, um, I'm not wanting my servants to fight a physical war. The kingdom's not about eating and drinking. No, it's about these other qualities, which, if you can see, should be present in you and in me and in anyone who comes to Christ and tries to live that type of life. Emphasis is spiritual. It's not on the physical kingdom. It's on the spiritual kingdom that Jesus was trying to establish. And, you know, if Jesus wanted to be a physical king here on the earth, you think he could have? People literally tried to make Jesus a physical king here on the earth. John chapter 6, 14 and 15, Jesus had to reject people trying to make him king. Like, no, that's not what it's about. That's not what I'm looking for. It's not what I'm going for. No, I am here to bring in a different type of kingdom, which is kind of a talking point throughout the Gospels that you read. Him trying to talk with the Jews and other people, trying to talk with the apostles about his kingdom not being of this world. He has to emphasize that many times and still people just weren't really getting it something that they were still trying to wrap their minds around because their hearts and their minds were based in the physical. And some people today, their hearts and minds are still based in the physical instead of the spiritual. Clearly, Jesus' emphasis was elsewhere. All right, next question. What was this kingdom supposed to look like? Well, what about when this kingdom comes? When will this kingdom come? And so I'm going to have some verses here on this one, and then the next slide will also kind of talk about this question. When will this kingdom come? First off, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, in response to this verse, I have one simple question. Are there 2,000-year-old people still living here on the earth? I don't think so. And I think that answers that pretty well. If there are not 2,000-year people still here on the earth in which this would apply to, it means the kingdom happens a lot closer to that time period and not necessarily something that we're waiting on for the future. Of Other passages that kind of talk about this and use this language. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or, or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Actually, just go ahead and skip down with me to verse 25. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, a couple of points that I want to take out of that. First off, you see the question at hand, verse 20, when is this kingdom coming? Now, as part of his answer, he reemphasizes the first point that we made. What will this kingdom look like? Well, it's not something that comes with observation, like, oh, there's this big temple, or there's this big castle and the, the grand king. No, no, that's not what it's about. No, the kingdom of God is within you, or perhaps a better translation is in your midst right now. Now, what does he mean by that? He's talking about himself. 
and how he has come to epitomize this kingdom, to usher this kingdom in. Not the kingdom that they were looking for, but the kingdom that was planned, planned by God and planned by Jesus. This is the kingdom that we get to be a part of. These were things that were happening in that generation, a generation in which Jesus was going to have to suffer through some things, but it seems to be directly connected to this kingdom. First, the Son of Man must suffer these things in this generation. You have other language like that. Um, John chapter 12, John chapter 12, 32 through 36, uh, Jesus talking about the way that he was going to die and how it was coming soon. So not only does this talk about uh, when the kingdom comes, but it kind of answers the whole premillennial concept of uh, this was a mistake. This wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, God and Jesus couldn't have seen this coming. Uh, no. Jesus makes it very clear what the plan was and how he was on board with this plan, how his hour was about here in which he is going to rise up from the earth, signifying by what death he was going to die. He knew it was coming soon, but he also knew what was going to accompany his death and his resurrection. Because of what Jesus Christ suffered, it was going to pave a way for the future. And you know, even after Jesus went through what he did, he still looks back and he doesn't change his course. He doesn't change his language. Because some people might say, yeah, well, what he's saying before his death and his resurrection, it doesn't really mean what it's supposed to mean. Uh, he didn't really mean and think that he was going to die and be rejected by the Jews. Well, what about after? What about after he died and rose? Uh, look briefly at the very end of Luke. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Jesus says, it was necessary for me to suffer. Actually, it was planned for me to suffer. And let me show you. Let's go back and let me explain to you what this meant, what it always has meant, and how it never changed, and how I was on board with it. That was why I came into this world to begin with. And they're still trying to understand it and wrap their minds around it. But Jesus here is trying to explain it to them. It was necessary, necessary for me to suffer. That paved the way for the future. And what comes in the future? Jesus, he has language like, I'm trying to establish my kingdom. It's not the physical kingdom that you're looking for, but it's a different type of kingdom. But first, I'm going to have to go through some things here on the earth. Well, the last point that I want to make, which kind of coincides with this, the church and the kingdom go hand in hand, and it was foretold. Back when Jesus was here on the earth, he talks to Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What you bind on earth will be bound. What you loose on earth will be loosed. And that's kind of what Peter is doing once you get over to Acts chapter 2. After Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he's here on earth for a little bit of time, preparing the way, uh, preparing the way for the helper to come down and for what to happen for the church to begin here on earth, for the kingdom to begin. The kingdom that's full of Christians right now. Now, sure, there is an element in which we're still waiting for the full picture of the glorious heavenly kingdom when we get to be with God for eternity. But there's a very real sense in which right now we are a part of this kingdom. We are a part of this church, the church universal that was planned, that was executed before time even began. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church, Jesus Christ, what he was going through, what he would do to establish this church and this kingdom, it was planned. 
God knew, even if no one else got it, God did. That was his plan. And now we get to be a part of it. And some of the most beautiful verses in relation to this come in Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. What Jesus went through, what he accomplished, what he always planned on accomplishing was to pave the way for us to be a part of this kingdom. His love, his blood allows us to be in there. And that's a wonderful blessing that is taken away whenever you go down a premillennial route. So through Jesus Christ, we can be a part of this kingdom right now. Part of this church, part of this family with Jesus Christ as our head. That was not a mistake. No, that was a beautiful plan. Something that was known before time began, something that was talked about throughout Scripture. And, you know, you can look throughout the Old Testament and see many examples of this, the prophecy of what's to come. Just for time's sake, just go to one of them. Daniel chapter 2. You remember this story? The dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, there were going to be nations of the earth that rise, but they were going to fall. But the rock that is cut without hands which is the church, which is the kingdom of God, is going to come in and it's going to overtake all these other kingdoms, but it's not one made with hands. It's not one whose focus is on the physical. No, it's one that will be forever, here and in the life to come. That was planned, that was prophesied, and that prophetic kingdom comes true. Because if you're going to try to go against this, if you're going to go against prophecy, then you might as well throw the Bible out. Because you're saying, well, it's not really true. That's not how it happened. No, that is how it happened. And that's how God intended it for it to happen since the beginning. And so some overall conclusions from this lesson. Like I was just saying, prophecy is fulfilled through Jesus, through that plan, and through what we are doing here right now. Here is part of this church. Here is part of this kingdom. Once again, the church and the kingdom are one and the same. They're not mutually exclusive. We're not waiting for a physical reign here on the earth. And with that being said, remember, your reward is not about what's coming here on the earth. Your reward is up in heaven. And that is what we are working towards right now. Here in this life, here in what we're doing this morning, is working towards that full realization of the kingdom of his glory to be with Jesus Christ forever in heaven. And this morning, right now, you have a chance to be a part of his kingdom. And that's a wonderful blessing that no one should ever take away from you. And so that's the invitation for all of us here. Are you a part of his kingdom? You can be. You can be a part of his kingdom right now. To become a Christian, to live that type of life, to pave that way for the glory to come. I appreciate your attention this morning. I hope that these are some helpful thoughts. And I hope that you can always remember, we get to be God's people. We don't have to be Jews to do it, but we get to be a Christian. And that is a wonderful blessing, a wonderful promise that all of us here can have today. And if there's any way that we might be able to help you accomplish that this morning, to be a part of his kingdom, you can let it be known as we stand and as we sing.